Film and slide portions of the following program are brought to you in color and black and white. Do you remember when this room created a furor in Detroit? The year was 1933, and the place is the Rivera Court of the Detroit Institute of Arts. The great Mexican artist Diego Rivera had been commissioned to paint his impression of Detroit on the walls of what had been a quiet, restful Renaissance court. Rivera found Detroit as dynamic as we have always boasted it to be, and so that's how he painted it. A lesser artist might have painted Lamont the Cadillac sailing up the Detroit River, being greeted by Indians. Very colorful, appropriate, and quite innocuous. Instead, Rivera painted Detroit's mighty industrial strength, and a great many people were shocked. There were meetings of protest, and petitions to have the paintings actually removed. The idea of finding beauty in machinery was fairly new in 1933. Also new was the concept of labor as a bargaining force in industry. Like every great artist, Rivera was both a product and a prophet of his times. The north panel shows the making of a motor. Although it is crowded with details, these details are simplified in the style of 20th century art. For example, there are no buttons on the overalls of the working men. They are suggested, the buttons that is, instead of described, like the forms of modern sculpture which you saw exhibited with them in Rivera Court. The south panel shows an automobile assembly line, also detailed and yet simplified by a great master of modern art, Diego Rivera. In this panel, incidentally, Rivera included the two men responsible for the murals, Edsel Ford, who donated them, and Dr. William Valentiner, director of the museum, when they were commissioned. <coughs> well, that's the story of the Rivera murals, one of the world's renowned masterpieces in your Detroit Institute of Arts. I'm John Morse of the museum staff, and in a moment, I'll be back with more pictures to show you and more stories about them. <laughs> WWJ-TV presents A Visit to the Institute of Arts with your host, the Institute's Director of Communications, John D. Morse. I'm sure that everyone is confused on first entering an art museum, and whether it be the Metropolitan in New York City, or the Louvre in Paris, or our own Detroit Institute of Arts, your own, because it's one of the few museums owned completely by the people. Well, there are several ways of looking at a museum. You can simply browse, as in a bookstore, or you can follow the fascinating course of civilization from Egypt to Picasso, or in our museum, you can simply turn right into gallery number one as you enter the front door and follow the numbered galleries. Placed here and there, you'll find one of these floor plans to help locate yourself or you can carry your own floor plan with you in one of these free leaflets that you can get at the front desk. First, let's pause in the Great Hall, which is devoted to medieval tapestries and armor. This is where people gather for exhibition openings. Incidentally, most of them are members of the Founder Society, which anyone may join. This is the core of the building. Opening from it are doorways leading into galleries containing as many of the 20,000 works of art in the collection as space permits. If you were to enter this last doorway and turn right, you'd find yourself in gallery number one. It is devoted to the great Baroque artists of the 17th century, such as Peter Paul Rubens. And here is Rubens' painting of the biblical story of Abigail meeting David with presents to intercede for her husband. It's a canvas eight by five feet. Its size, its historical subject matter, and its marvelous details express the dashing century of the Three Musketeers just as Rivera murals express our own. Also in the Baroque Gallery, you'll find a masterpiece by Rubens' French contemporary, Nicolas Poussin. It's another large painting, this time telling the story of Salome and Endymion from Greek mythology.
A third painting in the Baroque gallery is not so typical in style as the others. It is St. Francis in Ecstasy by El Greco, who painted not quite like any artist before or since his time. In the large gallery across from the El Greco are the museum's famous Dutch paintings of the 17th century, such as this quiet river scene by Meindert Habana. The Protestant people of Holland, unlike their contemporaries to the south in what is modern-day Belgium, had recently won their independence from Catholic Spain and they settled down to enjoy themselves and their country. So instead of painting stories from history and the Bible, most of them painted pictures of themselves. Here is Franz Hall's portrait sketch of a laughing boy, one of his own sons, actually, and one of the first paintings of children shown exactly as they are, rather than as their parents wished they were. That was one of Hall's contributions. Here is van der Heyden's view of Delft, the Dutch city famous for its blue chinaware, and a fine example of Dutch landscape painting. Except for the costumes of the people, the picture looks very much today, or the Delft itself looks very much today, as when van der Heyden painted it in the 1600s. And that, of course, is another of the fascinations of painting, both the places and the people. And here, even the chickens seem timeless. Here is Peter de Hoek's painting of a mother and child, seated in a typical, neat, clean, Dutch room with the sunlight streaming in through the window. But here is a Dutch painting that is greater than Holland. It is the visitation of Elizabeth to Mary by Rembrandt, perhaps the most famous name in painting. A master craftsman, Rembrandt succeeded with the magic of light and dark in giving to everything he painted a deep sense of the mysterious relationship between God and man. It's an idea expressed better in paint than in words. But now let's continue our trip through the galleries of the Art Institute in numerical order. Here you enter an actual room from a French chateau of the 18th century. The room is completely furnished in the style of the great kings that preceded the French Revolution, Louis XIV, XV, and XVI. Note in the corner the bust of Benjamin Franklin, a reminder of the close connection between America and France at the time. It was an elegant age, both in Europe and America, as we shall see presently. The music of Mozart, which you can hear in the background, is as clear and concise and ordered and beautiful as this room. A long way from the elegant 18th century is this scene of 125 people celebrating a wedding. It would have been utter chaos to the actual observer, such a scene, but note how the artist has reduced it to marvelous harmony by composing it around a simple pyramid whose apex is the dancing couple in the center. It's, of course, the wedding dance, painted by Peter Bruegel the Elder in 1565, and is probably the museum's most famous picture. I think of Bruegel as the Shakespeare of painting. He saw beyond the world's terrible complexities and contradictions to its basic harmony, the gift of every great artist. Bruegel saw people as they are, handsome, ugly, lovable, mean, contradictory, kind, cruel, but still people, wonderful and precious. Let's just look at some of them for a minute. The artists who immediately preceded Bruegel in the Netherlands were the Flemish painters who invented oil paint. You'll recall, perhaps, our great exhibition of their work at the museum two years ago. The greatest of these painters was Jan van Eyck, 
whose picture of St. Jerome in his study is perhaps the biggest little picture in our collection. It's only eight and a quarter inches high, yet into it Van Eyck has packed as much detail as Rubens did in his enormous painting of Abigail and David. Another marvelous painting in the museum's Flemish collection is this Madonna of the Rose Garden by an artist known only as the master of the St. Lucy legend. He was also a master of marvelous detail, as you see in the figures of the saints who surround the Madonna. And in the figure of the Christ child himself. Well, from the Flemish gallery of the Art Institute, we can go in several interesting directions. One that immediately suggests itself is to Italy, where the little Van Eyck painting we saw was once owned by the famous Medici family. Here is a painting by the great Italian Renaissance artist Leonardo da Vinci and his teacher Andrea del Verrocchio. It is unfinished, as you see, with the kneeling figure of the Madonna on the left only sketched in outline. But the right side of the picture is pure Leonardo. Its realistic details endowed with the kind of mystery that marked the genius of Leonardo da Vinci. Leonardo's teacher, Andrea del Verrocchio, was also a sculptor, like most artists of the Italian Renaissance. Here is his little bronze of Judith, brandishing the sword with which she cut off the head of Holofernes. Now what distinguishes a great work of art from an ordinary one, I think, is the quality of vitality and energy, which you see here in every line. Again, it's easier to see than to describe. In the same enormously rich gallery of Italian art, you'll find this masterpiece by Giovanni Bellini. The Madonna and Child are posed in front of one of the first Italian landscapes ever painted. The effect is serene, quiet, and lovely. But it's interesting to reflect that when this picture was painted, people objected to it as violently as they did to our Rivera murals in 1933. The eye is our most conservative organ, and the style of Giovanni Bellini was new. Now, let me show you the kind of art that people had been looking at for nearly a thousand years before Bellini painted this picture. You enter the gallery of early Christian art. Quiet, solemn, remote, yet very real in the intensity of its emotion. This is the style of the Middle Ages, simplified in detail, more concerned with the reality of the next world than with this one. It's been called the Dark Ages, but they're by no means dark, as you can see in the rich colors of the robes of the Madonna. Her face is timeless rather than timely, eternal rather than external. It is the expression of a sublime concept <coughs> instead of an historical idea. The Gothic hall, with the original chapel in the corner, which we'll see presently, is a reminder that this was the last great age of original architecture before our new modern masters, Richardson, Sullivan, Wright, and the others. As someone once said, this is architecture built with style rather than in style. It was true of Gothic buildings, such as this chapel in the corner. It's true of our greatest buildings today, such as the United Nations in New York. Well, we've seen how the art of the Western world has been about evenly divided in time, and if not in quantity, between realism and abstraction. Now, as we continue on our visit to the Art Institute, I'd like to show you that the same changes in artistic style occurred in the ancient world as well. Look at this cat, for example. Was it made last year or during the Middle Ages, or did it first see the light of day of thousands of years ago? Well, actually, it was made in Egypt 2,500 years ago when people were more interested in representing the idea of a thing rather than the thing itself. I'd like to come back to Egypt in just a moment. But first, let's have a look at an entirely different civilization whose viewpoint was just the opposite 
of that of the Egyptians. This head of a Roman is as real as if it were made during the Renaissance or the 19th century, or as real as the head of St. Jerome in Van Eyck's painting. It expresses completely the age of the materialistic Roman Empire, one of whose writers said, a bit of sound sense makes a man, the rest is rubbish. Here's another civilization, that of Greece in the fifth century BC, the golden age of Pericles. It was the age that marked the beginning of most of our present day philosophy and science. We call ours the atomic age. The atom itself was first defined in Greece when these sculptures were being carved. It was an age of balance between the real and the ideal, between form and content, between the next world and this one. And I must tell you, incidentally, that when we were photographing this Greek head, the idea of moving the camera in for a close-up, as with the Roman head, seemed completely out of place. And the reason was just that this head is idealized instead of particularized. It shows the idea of a man, which you can see immediately from a distance of six feet. You don't feel the impulse to examine it more closely. Here, obviously, is another form of expression in art, another style. It's Egyptian, and like the European figure of the Middle Ages, is an expression of a religious idea rather than a physical human being. Now let's go beyond the Nile and the Tigris rivers to the Orient, where a totally different concept of the relationship of God and man is evident in every work of art. And yet the extraordinary thing is that the works of art themselves are as full of energy and feeling as those we have seen from the Western world. Paul Cezanne, the pioneer of modern painting, once defined all art as a harmony parallel to the harmony of nature. Cezanne might have been speaking of this masterpiece of Chinese painting from the 13th century by Chen Chuan. It is one of the great Chinese paintings of the world, and one that Detroit should be proud to own, which we are. Incidentally, the, the camera, again, is the perfect way to view it, because these scrolls were intended to be unrolled a section at a time. And so, as we move with the camera from left to right, we see a series of perfect compositions, each one complete in itself. The whole picture is a perfect composition, and yet the artist has not lost sight of the importance of detail. The insects at the edge of this marsh are so marvelously painted from memory, not from models, that a University of Michigan professor had no difficulty identifying each one. Here, certainly, is the perfect balance of form and content, which the Greeks were the first to formulate and also the first to admire. The same feeling for the balance of form and content appears, of course, in the art of the Japanese, who follow the Chinese in their great tradition. Here, marvelously illustrated in this illustration from the great Japanese novel, The Tale of Genji. We've seen about 5,000 years of the world's great art from Europe to the Orient. Now, where do we as Americans fit into this picture? Well, I think we fit in very impressively indeed. But too often we're inclined to overlook the fact. One fact is that the Detroit Institute of Arts owns the greatest collection of American art west of the Appalachian Mountains. Let's go now and look at it. You begin your tour of the American collection in this room of the 1600s, when America was a small British colony. It's simple, and primitive, and sturdy. The Indian rug on the table was imported by clipper ship to New England. Here is a portrait of one of those stalwart English immigrants who helped build America. He is James Bowden, a Yankee ship owner, as is indicated by the ship in the background of the picture. Now let's move along to one of the most interesting exhibits in your museum. It is Whitby Hall, an actual house built near Philadelphia in 1754. 
It was being torn down when our own museum building was being erected, and so we were able to transport it here. The windows and shutters are original. Also original is this handsome staircase and the living room to the right, which we'll see in just a moment. This is the American counterpart of the room from 18th century France, which we saw earlier. And in its own way, I find it just as elegant. Notice the porcelain tea set in the wall cabinets imported from China. The shelves might have been filled by silver, or with silver by Paul Revere, whose work is well represented in the museum's collection. In Whitby Hall hangs one of the museum's 13 paintings by John Singleton Copley, America's greatest artist of the period. Here is another painting by Copley, one version of a picture called Watson and the Shark. It depicts an actual happening that occurred in Boston Harbor when Copley was a young man. And here is the strength and vitality that we associate with Rubens and the other great masters, a quality hard to describe. But you see it here in the detail of the sketch of the Negro boy's head, and in the sketch that, that Copley made of the same head, which is also in the museum's collection. In the 19th century, American artists discovered America. Here is George Caleb Bingham's remarkable picture of fur trappers descending the Missouri. The astonishing thing is that this kind of painting should appear almost overnight in our new country, where there were no art schools, no museums, and no great tradition of painting. Yet here is a minor masterpiece created in the middle of a new, raw continent. Here's another example of the same intensely American quality, this time from Long Island. It's called The Banjo Player, and it's by an artist known as William Sidney Mount. It is as American as Walt Whitman, who was Mount's contemporary and neighbor. Another of the great American masters of the last century was, of course, Winslow Homer, who started as a young artist reporting the Civil War for Old Harper's Magazine. Here is one of his Civil War paintings, Defiance, inviting a shot before Petersburg, Virginia, 1864, is the full title. It's a small painting, only 12 by 18 inches, and yet on the screen it looks as monumental as Rubens. Homer's contemporary was Thomas Aikens, who specialized in painting people, such as this portrait of A.B. Frost, the famous illustrator for Joel Chandler Harris, who created the unforgettable character of Br'er Rabbit. Homer and Aikens both painted in the great tradition of American realism. A different kind of realistic painter was John Sloan of the next generation. His picture of McSorley's Bar, which you see here, has long been a favorite at the Detroit Institute of Arts. Sloan painted exactly what he saw, around him in Philadelphia and in New York City. He painted during a time when the general taste was for the more romantic pictures of France, such as those by Bouguereau. And so this kind of painting was dubbed the Ashcan School by the critics of the time, who, as we have seen, were often unable to perceive the true strength, vitality, and imagination of many artists of their own period. <coughs> Excuse me. We have seen many epochs of art, fascinatingly different and alike. But I think one general pattern has emerged, that art through the ages has alternated between realism and abstraction. And by abstraction, I mean elimination of non-essential details to get at the heart of the matter. Like a lawyer makes an abstract of a case. The art of Egypt and that of the Middle Ages was largely abstract in this sense. Recall the Egyptian cat. It's expressive of ideas rather than representative of surface details. Well, now, for some reason, which I don't pretend to know, the art of the 20th century has returned to this style of abstraction, as in this stone frog by the late John Flanagan, one of the great sculptors of America. Well, now, let's, the same thing was happening in painting. So let's look at a few paintings which further illustrate the point. Modern painting began, in a sense, with the so-called Impressionists of Paris late in the 19th century. This painting by Claude Monet is a fine example. 
Actually, the Impressionists were concerned with simulating the effect of sunlight on objects, but what they contributed to modern painting was a new delight in pure color, <coughs> and with the technique of using pure color, they were able to create a marvelously realistic effect of light and atmosphere. One of the giants of modern painting was, of course, Vincent van Gogh, whose self-portraits you see here. He took the pure colors of the Impressionists and converted them into powerful expressions of his own intense emotion. Another direction of modern painting emphasized construction and design instead of emotional content. Such a painter was Henri Matisse, whose picture called The Window in the Detroit Institute of Arts was the first Matisse to enter the collection of any American museum. Karl Hofer, a German artist, was primarily interested here in the planes and surfaces of the rooftops and the buildings. But he has used them, I think you'll agree, to create a, a perfectly charming landscape. An American who delighted in both expressive color and abstract design was Lionel Feininger, whose paintings of ships at sea succeed marvelously in expressing the whole wonderful world of the ocean yet at the same time remain superb abstract decorations. And this brings us to the painting of today, 1962. Completely abstract, without reference to subject matter, confusing to some people, and very exciting to others. One of the first of these pictures to be painted was the oil called White Forms by the Russian artist Vasily Kandinsky. Painted in 1911, it anticipated the abstract expressionists of 1962. I'd like to tell you a rather personal story about it as you look at it. Before it was given to the museum, we were storing it in the basement along with some other paintings owned by a German collector, and so I was able to borrow it for my office and admire it every day for three years. One day my mother came to my office and looked at it. She had had no experience of modern art whatsoever, and so I was naturally curious to have her reaction. She asked me the name of it. I told her it had no name, no title, except white forms. It's beautiful, she said, but I see a lot more than white forms. I see trees, clouds, sky, houses, and even people. It doesn't need a name. I hope we've made it clear that every great work of art is as highly complex, individual, and fascinating as the human being who created it. I hope we've also made it clear that in addition to being an expression of its time, every great work of art has a life of its own, quite independent of its surroundings, no matter where or when it was created. I often think of these marvelous works of art that we've been looking at. I think of them when they're all alone at night in the darkened museum, but they're still very much alive, even when no one is there to see them. They await only the magic of light to share with you their energy, vitality and humanity. I've enjoyed taking you through the museum. I hope to see you there soon. A visit to the Institute of Arts was written and narrated by John D. Morse, the Institute's Director of Communications, with cinematography by James E. Jewell, and color photography by Joseph Kleima. A visit to the Institute of Arts was directed by John Rogers with technical direction by Anthony Kubala. This program was presented in the public interest by WWJ-TV in cooperation with the Detroit Institute of Arts. He was a man with a terrible secret. Watch Spellbound, starring Hugh O'Brien, Oscar Homolka, and Maureen O'Hara, tonight at 10 on Channel 4, the Detroit News. Did you know that every $6,000 worth of United States goods shipped abroad means a job for one more American worker? Learn more about experts in America's future by writing to...